Hello and welcome to Drugs Plus. Whether you're here for exam revision or just general interest, I hope you find this video useful. If you do, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for similar content coming soon. Today's video is part of my current series on therapies for type 2 diabetes and this particular video focuses on glucagon-like peptide 1 or GLP-1 analogues. I'm going to start with a brief introduction about the disease itself. Islets of Langerhans are small patches of endocrine tissue in the human pancreas. They contain alpha cells, beta cells and delta cells among others. When our gastrointestinal tracts are empty, usually in periods above three hours after a meal, alpha cells secrete glucagon. Glucagon acts in a wide range of tissues in the body all with the aim of ensuring blood glucose concentrations don't get too low. These effects include inhibiting glucose uptake by bodily tissues, as well as the breakdown of storage molecules to generate glucose. However, when glucose is being absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, usually shortly after a meal, beta cells are stimulated to secrete insulin. Additionally, Glucose also stimulates enteroendocrine L cells to secrete GLP-1, which in turn increases glucose-dependent insulin secretion. As well as inhibiting the secretion of glucagon, and therefore inhibiting all of its effects, insulin acts in a large variety of tissues, all working to reduce blood glucose concentration. These effects include increasing glucose uptake into bodily tissues, as well as increasing the production of storage molecules. As you can see, these two hormones have opposing effect and together produce blood glucose homeostasis. However, in type 2 diabetes, the insulin arm of this process is diminished. This can be caused by dysfunctional beta cells resulting in, in reduced insulin secretion or reduced insulin sensitivity in peripheral tissues, or indeed both. The incidence of type 2 diabetes is rapidly increasing in all four countries of the UK, with 10% of the NHS's budget going towards tackling the condition. A more detailed description of type 2 diabetes can be found in my introduction video, which I'll provide the link for in the description box below. One family of drug that has been in development for almost 30 years to treat diabetes are the GLP-1 analogues. Arguably, the most important role of GLP-1 is increasing glucose-dependent insulin secretion. It does this by direct stimulation of GLP-1 receptors on pancreatic beta cells. But first, I'm going to show you the normal process of glucose-dependent insulin secretion and then how GLP-1 enhances this. So, when blood, glu when blood glucose concentration is elevated after a meal, glucose enters beta cells by glucose transporters. It then gets metabolized by glycolysis, the TCA cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, producing ATP. This ATP binds to and blocks ATP-dependent potassium channels. This channel usually mediates a constant potassium efflux maintaining the cell's membrane potential. So when this is blocked, the cell becomes depolarized. This causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open, facilitating a calcium influx. This calcium works both directly and via secondary enzymes to stimulate the exocytotic release of insulin. That is the process of glucose-dependent insulin secretion. So on to GLP-1. GLP-1 is a protein synthesized from proglucagon in enteroendocrine L cells in the ileum and colon. When nutrients are absorbed in these areas of the gastrointestinal tract, GLP-1 is also released into the bloodstream. As the GLP-1 receptor is G-protein coupled, its activation mediates GTP to be exchanged for GTP. I will be uploading a video all about G-protein coupled receptors soon. This allows the alpha subunit to dissociate and activate adenylyl cyclase, which stimulates the production of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which goes on to phosphorylate and inactivate 
ATP-dependent potassium channels. As in the previous slide, this causes the cell membrane to depolarize, which opens voltage-gated calcium channels. This causes a calcium influx, which mediates the exocytotic release of insulin. This insulin secretion is glucose dependent because it requires ATP for adenylocyclase activity. This is very important as sulfonylureas are now used far less often as they evoke insulin secretion that is independent to glucose levels. This is explained more clearly in my video on sulfonylureas which I will provide a link for in the description box below. But the effects of GLP-1 don't end there. GLP-1 increases the transcription of the insulin gene, as shown here. GLP-1 receptor activation increases the expression of transcription factor PDX1, which binds to the A1 promoter on the insulin gene. The increased concentration of CAMP, as discussed in the previous slide, binds to the CAMP response element, also close to the transcription start site. These processes are believed to increase the transcription of the insulin gene. GLP-1 has also been shown to reduce insulin resistance in peripheral tissues. This insulin resistance in patients with type 2 diabetes is caused by macrophage infiltration into peripheral tissues. These macrophages secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, which remove PI3 kinase from the cell membranes which prevent signal transduction in response to insulin receptor activation. And that is shown here. Another effect of GLP-1 is decreased glucagon secretion. GLP-1's action of reducing glucagon secretion in the post-absorptive state is too great to be down to paracrine signal of insulin alone. It has been shown that GLP-1 activates GLP-1 receptors on pancreatic delta cells stimulating the release of somatostatin which inhibits glucagon secretion from alpha cells. Surprisingly, GLP-1 has also been shown to inhibit glucagon secretion on alpha cells directly, despite fewer than 0.5% of them containing any GLP-1 receptors whatsoever. GLP-1 has also been shown to increase beta cell mass. One way it does this is by extruding the FOXO1 transcription factor from nuclei of exocrine ductal cells in the pancreas. FOXO1 inhibits PDX1, so the absence of FOXO1 increases its activity, allowing it to stimulate the conversion of the cell to a beta cell. GLP-1 has also been shown to induce the transdifferentiation of alpha cells to beta cells, as well as the mitosis of existing beta cells. Gastric emptying is another effect of GLP-1. GLP-1 acts on vagal nerves directly, increasing tonic contraction of the pyloric region of the stomach, preventing food from entering the intestines, while also decreasing peristalsis, decreasing the motility of any food that does reach the intestines. GLP-1 also acts on gastric parietal cells, reducing gastric acid secretion, thereby reducing the speed of nutrient absorption. A delay in gastric emptying is advantageous for type 2 diabetics because it decreases the speed at which glucose enters the bloodstream. The final two effects of GLP-1 do not affect type 2 diabetes directly, but can help prevent common diabetic complications. The first of these effects is cardioprotection. GLP-1 receptors are expressed in all four chambers of the heart as well as the sinoatrial node just as abundantly as in the pancreas. It has been shown to decrease cardiac ischemia, particularly in patients post myocardial infarction, decrease platelet aggregation and systolic hypertension. The cardioprotective qualities of GLP-1 aren't completely agreed upon however. Some more recent papers have shown the opposite, that GLP-1 agonists cause cardiac deterioration in patients with heart failure, so obviously more research needs to be done here. The second of which is diabetic nephropathy. This is a condition that affects 35% of 
patients with type 2 diabetes. It involves an accumulation of reactive oxygen species causing damage to the glomerulus, causing a decreased glomerular filtration rate and increased albuminuria. The progression of both of these symptoms has been shown to be slowed by GLP-1. So now onto some example drugs. In 1992, Eng et al. isolated a protein called Exendin-4 in the venom of the Gila monster. A synthetic form of this, exenatide, was the first GLP-1 agonist to make it to market. This is GLP-1 shown here, and this is exenatide. As you can see, the sequence homology is only around 53%. But the main difference to note is position 2. Here, the alanine residue has been substituted for glycine. This prevents degradation by DPP4. Physiologically, DPP4 cleaves GLP1, inactivating it at this position, making its half-life in the body only around 2 minutes. This substitution increases the half-life to 2.4 hours, Exenotype is therefore able to be injected twice daily, one hour before each meal, and is still on the market today. However, the time requirements for twice daily administration was difficult and inconvenient for patients and produced poor patient compliance. The solution to this came in the form of liraglutide. As you can see, liraglutide doesn't have a substituted alanine residue at position 2, but it is acylated with a palmitic acid molecule at lysine 26, which increases its half-life above that of exenatide, meaning it could be administered only once daily without regard to mealtime proximity. However, despite its more convenient administration method, it isn't as effective as exenatide at reducing blood glucose concentration and is today more commonly prescribed for obesity than diabetes. This turned the focus back on exenatide, and eventually a once-weekly treatment was developed. It had the exact same sequence as the twice-daily treatment, but was encapsulated in a polymer microsphere which slowly releases the drug into the bloodstream over the course of a week. This treatment proved to be very successful and was shown to be more effective at reducing blood glucose concentrations than either of the original two treatments. The success of the once-weekly formulation of exenatide resulted in the development of lixisenatide, a drug almost identical to exenatide apart from the addition of six lysine residues. The idea was that the drug would have the efficacy of exenatide but an even higher affinity to the GLP-1 receptor due to its lysine chain. While both of these measures were true, exenatide was still more popular due to its one-week formulation. With the importance of the once-weekly administration method in mind, albiglutide was developed. This drug is comprised of two GLP-1 molecules joined together with the alanine-glycine substitution as seen in exenatide, as well as the addition of an albumin molecule. These two alterations increased its half-life to around five days, making once-weekly injections possible. Despite this, albiglutide was shown to be poorer than all of its predecessors at reducing blood glucose concentrations. Around the same time, however, dulaglutide was developed. Dulaglutide is also made up of two GLP-1 molecules with the alanine-glycine substitution, but is this time joined by immunoglobulin G4 molecules. This increased its half-life to around five days, making once-weekly injections possible. Dulaglutide has been shown to be more effective at reducing blood glucose concentrations than even exenatide. And finally, semaglutide was developed in 2017. Semaglutide features a substitution of alanine 2 for alpha amino isobutyric acid, as well as the acylation of lysine 26 with an 18 carbon chain, both reducing DPP4 degradation. In 2018, a series of clinical trials showed that semaglutide is more effective at reducing blood glucose concentration than any other GLP-1 analogue. However, its relatively short half-life meant that it needed to be injected once daily, putting the future success of the drug into question. However, less than a year ago, semaglutide became the first GLP-1 receptor agonist to be approved for oral use. 
The reason why GLP-1 agonists have historically been administered subcutaneously is because they are peptides. Peptides are vulnerable in the stomach as they are broken down by various proteolytic enzymes. They are also impermeable to the phospholipid bilayers of intestinal membranes, meaning that any molecules that do survive can't be absorbed anyway. However, in its oral formulation, semaglutide is non-covalently bound to SNAP. This protects the drug from degradation in the stomach and allows it to permeate the intestinal membrane before dissociating in the bloodstream. Currently, only around 3% of patients with type 2 diabetes are prescribed with the GLP-1 agonist, but this development is huge and could soon make them one of the principal treatments for treating type 2 diabetes. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll be back with more pharmacology videos soon.